What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode on Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Got a special guest that's pretty much blowing up on YouTube, man. Been to prison, been through some things. You know how this thing goes. He's a pretty serious dude, but you know what? I can't tell his story. He can tell his story better than I can. Brother, tell the people who you are, where you're from, and let's talk a little bit about you and your channel, everything that you're doing. Hey, man, they call me Jay. I'm from Renegade Media on YouTube. I'm from Tulare, California. And basically, I was validated in all the structure, became a writer, came home, and realized that I wanted to create a YouTube channel to denounce all prison gangs and teach the kids not to join this kind of lifestyle. That it's, 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 it's not going to do it's not gonna do good for anybody. So that's been the basis of my channel, maybe it's just encouraging the youth to do something different with their life. So pretty much what, you're from Northern California? Uh, Central Valley. I'm in, I'm in the Central Area, Central California. People from down south look at me like Northern, but... The homies from up north look at me like I'm Southern, so we kind of very much split Central California. What was life like, you know, growing up in California for you when you were younger? Personally, um, I came from a good family. I chose the gangbang. I was inspired to become a gang member. I love my environment and the city where I'm from, two neighborhoods, east side and west side, two gangs within each neighborhood. And so that's all I was surrounded by was Northanial politics, Northanial gangs. And my cousin was Norteño as well, so I wanted to be just like my cousin. So I got in the mix early on from like the ages of 8 to 12. I hung around Norteño gang members, started wearing the red. I was taught to put in work on anybody that had blue on. So as I got older, things just started getting worse and worse and worse for me. My situation is a little bit different because as soon as I turned 13, bad straight to juvie for putting in work, caught an assault with a deadly weapon case. Let's talk about that. You're a youngster. The dudes that you look up to are Nathaniels in your neighborhood. And do you see these cats as, as your role model? Is like, these are the dudes I want to be just like. Yeah, man. Um, well, really, it was just my cousin. My cousin was a big name on the neighborhood. Um, I haven't told this story yet, but my cousin, he was a, he was a street brawler. Yeah, my uncle and my dad, they were known. My dad was a, a third-degree black belt. But he didn't join gangs. But what he did was he took my cousin and my uncle on the streets and they would brawl different neighborhoods for money. That's how it was back in the day before people started picking up guns and picking up knives is they would go swap different people, street beefs, and they'd make money off it. So my cousin was well known for putting in work for me and having hands. I grew up around the time where Southerners started coming around to Larry, California. So instead of me just going fighting a different dude from a different neighborhood and this bet on it, now I have to go put in work for the neighborhood. So I looked at my older homies, watched them put in work. I was like, man, I want to get into a fight with somebody. I want to get into a ride with somebody. I want to get into a melee. I was seeing these street melees, high school melees with Northerners and Southerners. And I would just sit there and be like, man, I want to do that one day. I want to do that one day. But I was too young to jump in for older dudes and older fights. So what they would do is they uh, they started me off and like, hey, bro, you're going to find my little female in the, in the backyard. So we start fighting. All right, well, we're going to take you around the hood for a little bit. And you see that kid right there? Go sock him up. So I'd run and sock some innocent kid up, beat him up over a bike, beat him up over a pair of shoes. But the homies wanted to see that I had art, that I wasn't going to hesitate, that I wasn't going to be scared, I wasn't going to start throwing up, nothing like that. That's what they were doing. They were just molding me. So when I finally got jumped in the hood and I got knocked out, they took me to a, a rival gang neighborhood and they dropped me out there and said, man, go do what you got to do. And I did, and I got arrested the very next day. So when you got jumped on and they knocked you out, who did that? The homies in my hood, um, they put a they put an older homie. He was uh, I was thirteen at the time and he was seventeen, but it was at a disadvantage because he was uh, not only an athlete, a pro athlete, like a good uh, a football player, but he did boxing on the side too. So as I'm getting jumped in the hood, he kind of pushed everybody off. We we went one on one, and every hit was a fatal blow. And the next thing you know, I'm thirteen years old, and I just got slept, and they woke me up, and I. I'm like, I'm cool, I'm cool, I'm cool. They're like, well, don't cry, bro. You better not cry. And I was like, I ain't going to cry. But I literally, I was like, I feel like crying. Like, my tears, I'll try to hold them back. I was like, well, don't do it right now. They hurt. And then they were like, you're good, bro. You're in the hood. And I was like, cool, bro, because I don't want to go through that again. Let me ask you this, right? When you're a young kid and you're looking up to these dudes, you ever hear the prison stories? Like, oh, oh the old boy just got out. He did 10 years. And you ever hear them stories? Well, actually, my older homies, there was only maybe two or three around my time that went to prison. But the homies that ran my hood, Vincent Uranga and Johnny Martinez, 
they didn't go to prison. Johnny Martinez actually went to the Marines. And when he came back out from the Marines, he took over the hood after Vincent got killed by a rival gang member. He was more or less teaching us how to work out, teaching us uh, like stuff out of the Marines, telling us to go to school, telling us to sell dope and make money and start establishing businesses because he had established a, a smoke shop. He was making wheat pipes back in the day. He was teaching us a little different. So that's the person that I looked at. My cousin's never been to prison. But the other homies that I did run into that came out of prison, like the homie boxers from the West, we didn't, I didn't hear up here the stories like that. I didn't really trip on the prison aspect. I was more or less like I was street politic. I wanted a gangbang because my neighborhood wound up getting deemed by my whole neighborhood, my little gang. So I wanted my gang wound up going heads up with every Nathaniel group in my neighborhood. So next thing you know, I'm just beefing with other Nathaniels shooting at each other. The prison politics didn't kick into effect until 2001 after the Black Widow operation and all the NF got indicted. It's when we started getting filters and a lot of homies started paroling to Tulare County and coming to our city like, hey, bro, you guys got to do this. You guys got to do that. Before then, before I hit juvie, I didn't know, really know nothing about prison politics. You know, I asked you that because I wanted to know, man, from a young mind standpoint, right? Like these dudes are going to prison. And I wanted to know if that ever affected you. Like, damn, bro, I don't want to go to prison, though. You know, I'm out here gangbanging, but there's always that possibility I can end up with a life sentence. I want to know if that ever enters a young man's mind. You know, 13, 15, 16, 17, 18. Does that ever enter a person's mind in that neighborhood? Well, um... Back then, thing was a uh, California Youth Authority was a big thing. So it's like when we went to juvenile hall and we went to boot camp, those were big things to us. That was that was our way of getting locked up. And if you got locked up in those areas, then you were somebody as a kid. I didn't start thinking about prison until like maybe 15, 16 after I paroled from the California Youth Authority, but I saw the daily weapon. I started running into a lot more homies that came out of prison. My homie Steven Moraz, uh, Gabriel Rodriguez. They were fresh out of prison taking over the streets. And I'm like, wow, this is this is power. And then they, for some reason, they just had a substantial amount of dope telling us what to push. But my homie Alex Coronado, he would give me like 520s, tell me to bring back, you know, 60 bucks and the 40 I would keep. And I was like, oh, I can make money for a big homie that came out of prison that has me all seen a lower connect. But really, it wasn't it wasn't that he said they had, they had access to dope. So I started looking at these dudes that came out of prison like, bro, whatever it is that they're doing in prison and they're coming out with this prestige, everybody's looking up to them. Everybody's quiet in this. These dudes can literally just snap their fingers and everybody shuts up. That's what I was like, bro, there's something about prison that I want to know about. And then the more and more I got involved with street politics and street regimes with the NF, I started seeing that politics and prison are issues. But that's what it's going to take. I got to go to prison in order to become these individuals that I'm starting to work for. Back then, if you'd asked me at 13, I'm like, I don't want to go to prison, but I want to be out here on the streets fighting. I want to pull triggers. I want to rob. I want to steal. I want to burglarize. I want to block neighbors. But once I started working for the prison politics aspect, something about it made me idolize it. It's hard to explain, but it's just, it's just the way these individuals carry themselves and the way these indiv one individual can go to one city and be like, hey, bro, I'm a bro. Bro, I'm a carla. And everybody just listens. So it makes you want to go to prison to become that individual. You think to yourself, I have to go to prison to become that kind of powerful prisoner. It's the power that you're infatuated, not really the persona. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to get there in a minute, right? Just want to make sure we get that out of the way, and then we're going to come back to it. You end up in that youth authority. What's that like for you? I mean, hold on. You went to this neighborhood. They drop you off in a rival neighborhood, and they say, hey, man, put in some work. What do you do in that neighborhood? Well, I went over there with a baseball bat, a little Louis Slugger bat that you get at the baseball games. I they didn't give me no gun, they didn't give me no knife, and I caught a southern recipient while he was gonna take pictures with his baby mama, and um, I started hitting him in the face with a baseball bat. And I split his eyebrows open, I left, I left him bloody. And then the first thing I did is I dropped the bat and I started running. What I didn't know was the indoor swap meet at the time already had cameras. I was already on probation for some other stuff, so I wound up running, cameras caught me on footage, probationers already knew where I was, I went home, I went to sleep, the next day, I, I was getting dressed to go to the hood, and the cops came knocking on my door and arrested me for assault. So I all I did was just beat up somebody with a little bat. I ain't gonna lie, I, I, like, I was panicking a lot because I thought they were my homies both were gonna be there right there to jump in so I could do my thing, but instead, it's all about you if you can stand on your own two feet. So my homies needed to drop me off in this neighborhood and leave me there in order to see if I could survive, if I could handle my own way, because I'm, you're not always gonna have homies around you. 
So beating this dude up with a little ass baseball bat, and I'm 13 years old. I don't, bro, I was like 120 pounds, bro. I don't got a lot of strength. I wasn't doing no push ups. I wasn't lifting no weights. I was smoking dope already. So I was like, you know what? I did what I had to do, ran home, and that's when I got arrested. Not even a day later. You go in the South Sider neighborhood, right, with this little bat or whatever. You could have ended up dying at 13 years old. A lot of 13 year olds get killed over there, right? Yeah. Yeah, they they were deep in that neighborhood, and I was the indoor swapping at the time. That was pretty much like their territory. But that's where all Nathaniel's in the city know to go. If you want to catch a settlement snipping, you got to go to the neighborhood of Moke, or you got to go to the indoor swap meet. And that's where they dropped me off. And it was just the perfect place. And just show good luck. I just seen a dude wearing a light blue penalty and shirt, tucked in with some blue jeans, blue shoes, and I was like, yeah, this is him. It took a while. I had to build up the courage to do it, but I did it. Was this fool fighting back or what? Yeah, no, he was more or less like he was trying to protect his girlfriend. His girlfriend was pregnant. And there was, a, there was an ounce of me that I was like, man, I'm going to hit her too if she jumps in. Because I was young. I didn't, wasn't taught the rules. There's been times where I've been jumped by cylinders and Pudenia Hainas where I would have to punch them to get them off me. So to rock this whole adrenaline, I was like, bro, if she jumps in, I'm going to hit her. And so his, his defense was just protect his girl and his baby mama. So it gave me a chance to have an open face so I could just hit him in the face a few times. But like I said, I left him bloody. Once I seen the blood, that's when I panicked and ran, dropped the thing outside, and I just ran as far as I could back to my neighborhood. Some people just heard that. They're probably going to be thinking, Dad, this dude's a messed up dude. Man, think about hitting a pregnant chick. But we're going to get into how you turn your life around. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. But those are the those are the po- the street politics there in California when, you know, you're a Norteño, you're a Southsider, Sereno, whatever, right? But now you end up in this youth authority. What's it like when you walk in there at 13 years old? Now you're locked up. Now you lost your freedom. What's it like for you? The the, the kid politics were dumb as hell, bro. But as soon as I got there, hey, bro, you got 14 days to get off on a Southerner. You can't program with us. I'm like, all right. So I do my thing. Then I started fighting Bulldogs because I started running into Bulldogs and why. Every facility that I went to, hey, bro, you got 14 days to get off on a Southerner before you can program a bus spread with the armies to kick you with the armies. So as soon as you get there, you got to fight. So I was like, all right, I'm already used to this because I went through juvenile hall through boot camp before I got to YA because they gave me a YA suspension because it was my first offense. So I'm already used to fighting in juvenile and boot camp like, on a consistent basis. So I was like, fighting ain't nothing. But now I run into Southerners that are humongous coming from Nellis and uh, Paso Robles down south. YTS, these dudes are huge. And I'm like still 13 years old. Like, man, how am I going to do this? So I'm like, nah, I ain't going to fight the big ones. I'm going to fight the little guys my size. But we start brawling. Then you start learning the rules. Hey, bro, you can't do this. You can't let a South Sider eat a red jello. Duh. You can't let a South Sider eat a salad bowl, a salad. You can't let a South Sider eat a sloppy Joe hamburger. Or you can't eat waffles because it just the South. There were, there were so much rules where I couldn't do all. I'm starving because I couldn't eat half the food. All the Wyatt games, hey, bro, if they tell you to shut the fuck up or they throw a blast, hey, you got you got to be quiet and silent. When I used to get mad, like, bro, I ain't going to shut up for nobody, bro. So I started fighting a lot more blacks, started fighting Southerners. But I only had a year or two months to do left, maxed out. So all the homies, what they did was, hey, bro, like, really? You can't catch any more time. So why don't you just keep fighting? And I thought that was the means to say, well, is that what you guys want me to do? And they played into that mind game, like, yeah, bro, they, they can't do nothing to you. You're going to go home regardless. Just keep fighting. So every time a new Southerner come in, he had 13 days to get off on the Northerner. So what would the homies do? Hey, you know he's going to take off on a homie, bro. Catch that fade. And I'm like, all right, boy. Like, in my heart, I'm like, I don't want to see the homie get hurt. So I would get him like, hey, what's up? We got 13 days. He'd be like, yeah, I'm like, just get down there. And then we start fighting right there. The homies used me, like, wrongfully. But in my, in my heart, I wanted to do it anyways. They made me fight. So my first term in YA, it was uh, 21 fights and four riots in a year and a half. And that's how, that's how gruesome it was for me. Are there racial politics there with the blacks and everything too? Yeah, the blacks mostly target the whites. They really do. Uh, they won't target Mexicans per se because you had Northerners, Southerners, and Bulldogs. They're not going to take us all on. But when it comes to racial politics, what I seen that I didn't like was the white boys were deep, then it'd be respectful. But if there's only one white guy there, they would they'd find any reason to pick on him. They beat him up in the shower. They beat him up on his bum. They start taking his food when he goes to chow. And I said, like, bro, that's, that's only because you guys are beat, bro. And it was called the Bay Area car. Uh, it was called Triple B 13. 
It was the Bay Area, the Bloods, the Bulldogs, and the Southsiders versus the Northerners, the Whites, and the Crips. So that's how it was a lot for a long time. But like I said, if the white boys were deep, then it was cool. But they, with the blacks would never go at it with the Mexicans. And if we did, it always had to be arranged. I right, look, you get five Mexicans and we'll get five blacks and we'll just fight five on five and that's it. But they would never want to pick on another Mexican because the Southerners were like probably the deepest. They're always like 20, 30 deep. Northerners would be 15 deep. So you're not going to pick on one of us without all of us jumping. All these, or I should say Woods, right? Were they fighting back or no? Some would, some won't. There was one that I, I, I rarely ever talk about his situation because, you know, like, I don't want to encourage that kind of behavior, but there was one called, his name was Mercado. He was from Merced or Mercado or something like that. And he was the only white boy in Calaveras at the time. And he fought back twice. And then there was this one time we were on the shower and there's like 10 people in the shower, all butt naked, showering and, I see this black dude from Oakland, a big buff black dude, and he started just beating on him. And Mercado put his head down, and he just got socked up for like 20 seconds. And it was that moment right there that he didn't fight back is when every black took advantage of him and started beating him up, started fucking him. And I was just see this kid wake up one day. I don't know what happened to him, and then I didn't see him get beat up. But he'd have a different black eye, swollen face, a busted lid. Until finally, he, he wasn't a sex offender. But he found his way to the sex event building for protection. And that's what I was like, damn, man, that's how low he had to go was going to the sex offender building just to be protected because, you know, he was just getting hurt, bro. And he was going to, he was, they weren't going to let him go home. It's crazy, man. Let me ask you this, right? You you got kids, right? Yeah. I got two stepkids and I just had my son uh, maybe six months ago. You got a son. Let me ask you this. What's your nationality? Are you Mexican? Yeah. And a lot of them South Siders are Mexicans too, right? Yeah. Grandparents are from Mexico, right? Mine are, but my my my, my no, it's my great grandparents from Mexico. My grandparents, they uh, they went to Texas and then my mom was born in Texas, came to California, and then I became a Californian. So anyway, long story short, I mean, South Siders, someone in their family started in Mexico, someone in your family started in Mexico. And now you guys are really the same people, but you come here and you're you know, you're fighting each other and you're Walking up, you're hitting this kid with a bat. And I know you changed your life, and we're going to talk about, you know, what, what you don't in your life. But, you know, you're walking up, man, but you're the same people. Why do we fight our own people, man? Why do we, you know, you're talking about you were beefing with other Norteños and beefing with South Stars. Why, man? Why do we destroy our own people? Really, I think, personally, we allowed, like, Mexicans are always going to hate other Mexicans regardless. If you think about it, you take the prison aspect out of it. I go to Mexico right now. Do you realize how they'll treat me out there? I'm plastical. I'm virtual. I don't know Spanish all the way. So I'm just frowned upon. I think it's just genetically in us that if you ain't from our area, you're going to be disliked. People in Mexico, if you're from Michoacan and Jalisco, they don't like each other because they talk different. The skin color is different. And then you go to, you go somewhere down farther down deep down in Mexico where the skin is even darker. They don't like the people that are close to northern Mexico. We divided ourselves. For, for no other reason that I can justify, we divided ourselves. So while the prison politics keep in effect, people don't fail to realize that that divisional line between North and South and Northern California started by the prison administration. People that were Mexican mafia, they put them in blue jumpsuits. Los La Familia, they put them in red jumpsuits just to distinguish the difference. And then that's when they said, all right, from Bakersfield down South, it's Southern California. Bakersfield up North, Northern California. So the NF and the Mexican mafia became recruiting from those divisional demographics placed by CDC in California. So now that's how we started dividing each other. Our Southerners wear blue, Northerners wear red. We allowed the prison politics to continue that internal fight amongst Raza. And we just play a part into it. And now you see Southerners taking out Southerners, Northerners taking out Northerners. It all does not make sense and it never will. It does. That's the one thing that I battle with every day and I try to explain, but I learned more from my audience on my YouTube channel when they say, hey, our son needs to stand together. We've been fighting each other. And I start telling people, yeah, we can band together all day. But I just think it's it's not only is it human nature, but it's always been in the Mexicano culture, our nature, to prey on each other. You got the cartels preying on the Mexican land, the Mexican people extorting them, hurting them just to further their agenda. But that's all these prison gangs are doing now, preying on their own people to further their agenda. We just became predatory behavior on our own people for our own means. And it's it's not fair. It's not going to stop, though. I can tell you that right now. It's not going to stop. 
I mean, I believe that. That's the sad reality that, you know, we see it all the time. You know, whites attacking whites. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about prison and Hispanics attacking Hispanics, blacks attacking blacks, people killing each other out here on the street, their own people, right? And all we're doing is destroying each other. All we're doing is, you know, allowing a mother to go to her son's grave and cry, right? When, you know, you switch it up and it could be your mother at that grave crying, you know? It could have been your mom at the hospital, like, damn, they hit my son in the face with a bat. Um, but I understand. I mean, this is the way that people grow up. I just wish that it wasn't that way. And like you said, it's probably never going to change. But anyway, you end up in prison. You go to prison. How much? What do you go to prison for? Now you go to adult prison. Let's let's go there. Um, I'll go to prison for a second degree on robberies, four counts, possession of firearms, six guns, and they gave me a ten year gang enhancement just because I took a picture with somebody. That's what I did. What's your total sentence? Fifteen years, one strike. You do how much time? I did the whole 15. Uh, I caught my second strike in prison for smuggling in drugs. And um, I was pretty much, I, I started working for some big homies. I was part of a squad. And the big homies were like, hey, bro, you got to start making money. And they wanted me to sell dope. And I've always said it on my YouTube channel. Like, I can't stand the thought of selling dope. I don't like selling dope. I've just never been a dope boy. You know what I mean? I didn't like dope at all. I smoked it, but I didn't want to sell it. So I just thought that was too much of a dirty hassle, a dirty hustle. So I just looked at it like, man, I need to come up with some come other reason to, to rob. I just I need to make money for the big homies plus myself because I had to pay 33% every month. So my big homie was like, hey, we'll go hit a leg, go hit a robbery. And I was like, I can do that. That's easy. So I got a couple of homies, the homies that were already doing robberies. And I was like, hey, let me jump in your crew. Let me go rob some stuff with you guys. And we just started robbing stores, furniture spots. The big homies seen that we were getting away with it at the time. And they were like, hey, you know, we can utilize these kids to do some other stuff. So, hey, bro, this fool owes me money. Go hit his house real quick. I want everything out the house. So I started doing house invasion. Hey, bro, go go find his stash spot. All right, I learned how to burglarize and break into houses and clean stuff up and bring back stuff. I became a thief and a robber. That was my main thing. A ski mask, the 12 gauge, run it to a store, put it to a clerk's face, empty out the register. Hey, big homie, here's your 33%. They didn't care how much money I stole. They just wanted 33% of what I made. So even if I came up on $800 in the cash register, 33% had to go to him. And then we split it three ways, which I'd, sometimes I'd walk home with like two, 300 bucks from a robbery. But then when I was hitting stuff like uh, the rent centers, I was coming up with seven grand. And then we were splitting that three ways after my 33% to him. And for some reason, the big homies I was working for had their hands in a cookie jar with a bunch of stuff. Or sometimes I didn't have to do nothing. They would just call me like, well, go hit this stuff. And I would hit it and they would walk. They were like, all right, bro, we're going to keep the money, but you can have the dope. And then I'd have a cool, like, little quarter cow of dope. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go sell whatever I can out of this, smoke the rest of it. So I'd make my money's worth with the dope that I could sell. And then I'd just smoke the rest. Like, bro, I'll just, I'll just rob somebody else. Bro, I'm not going to sell the rest of this. It's too much dope. And I wanted to just get the tweaked out, robbing more stuff. That's what I wanted to do. And that's how I caught my case. Was, uh, um, I got out. My preliminary, my prelim was 19 counts of armed robbery, but I confessed to four to get a good deal. And I confessed to my, what I did, how I was involved. And that's when they gave me the the four years for the robberies. I moved one year each for the four robberies, the gangs. They wanted that gang enhancement attached. For some reason, that was a big thing in 2005. They wanted to get us all indicted on these gang enhancement charges. You know, there's some youngsters watching right now from over there in Central California. I want them to realize that you were taking a chance of dying or going to prison for 10 years, 15 years, possibly life for $200. You walked away with $200 on some of them licks, right? Now, there was one I robbed the tacos down for 160 bucks. And I was like, well, what the am I doing? But the homie kept saying, like, hey, bro, this is a dick right here. And guess who it was? It was they were, they were Mexicanos. So my own people taught me how to be like that. So I robbed him for 160 bucks. You know those little, those little boxes where you put your little pencils in when you're in school? You know, you put all your pencils in your colored pencils. So they had it full of money. And as soon as I put the gun to the face, I didn't say nothing. They like, it's like they, it's happened to them before. And that was the part that hurt me afterwards. So they looked at me, seen the gun, and they just, everybody raised their hand. And I said, oh, this is la feria. And they just grabbed it, give it to me. And I walked out, $160. But I couldn't even give 32% to my big homie. And that's when my big homie was like, he picked me up. He's like, look, bro, if you're going to do stupid shit like that, I'll show you where you can hit something. And he had took me to a furniture spot, and he goes, what do you think of this? And I looked at it, I was like, bro, they sell couches here, bro. And he was like, yeah, but how much do those couches cost? How much do those paintings cost a look? I was like, I don't know. I have my own house. I, I still live with my mom. And he was like, bro, these people are paying two, $300 a payment for these couches. So 
He told me to hit that one. And when I did, I found two drawers, broke them. And I, it was like a blue Ziploc bag and it was a uh, 7,000 in cash. I was like, oh, that's when I was like, bro, I got to start hitting bigger stuff. So I was hitting, I was hitting cash registers at two. The homie started teaching me how to you know, drag them on the ground, hit, hit the safe. I found some safes in a couple of stores. So the money started getting better. But I hit one, I, 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 did, I took a 25 live risk for 160 bucks at a taco store. Well, let me ask you something. The money started getting better. You did 15 years. Was it worth 15 years of your life? Hell no. Because that money, once the court, the, once the court proceedings were done with the lawyer and how much money I was spending in county and in reception, by the time I hit the penal system, I only had a couple of thousand left. That didn't even last that long. Even if it don't last that long. I mean, even if you had a million dollars, man, it ain't worth 15 years of your life. At least I don't think it is. Um, nah, be, because I struggled in prison a lot until I got it. Until my, the, the politics started teaching me how to make hustles and how to bring in go. It wasn't worth it, bro. When I think about all the times that I struggled, that I, all the things that I endured, the people that I lost, the people that I hurt, it messed with your head mentally to the point where I was like, bro, oh, this, this sucks, bro. Like time, once you start doing time, it's slow. It only It's only until you reach the halfway point and you start going down, then it starts to speed up because you already became accustomed to living in a cell 23 hours a day. And I was in the penal system at the time where lockdowns would be like a year or two years straight in your cell until they changed the rules later. But still, those first few four years, it was hell, man, just being on lockdown for a year. I went at it with the, with the skinheads and I went at it with the blacks. So I started off rough to the point I was always on lockdown but can't go to store, so I can't spend money. So my life consisted of reading books and striking up We Lost to the Homies. Dude, it is not a way to live at all, period. It was not worth it. So now you're in this state prison system. What prison are you at? I went to Sad F C Yard on Building 7, my first prison. Uh, they overrided me because I already, ha I already had 54 points. I got into a two-on-two -two with the skinheads. But by that, by, this was a time where prison population was overpopulated. So if you had a, a short amount of points or close to the points where you can get overrided to a different level, they were just automatically overriding you. They didn't care. And so there was no weapons involved in this two-on-two. -two. I got to be overridden to a level three. As soon as I got there, riot with the blacks. I was like, man, dude, like, it's, like where am I? Like, what's going on where everybody just wants to fight now? Because that's where I'm landing in situations where, hey, bro, just get ready, bro. We're on a half six with the blacks. I'm like, all right, so it kicks off with the black. Then they send me to out-of-state Arizona to the private corporation CCAs. So now I'm in Arizona. They put us and the Southerners there, and now we go at it with the Southerners. Then they separated us. So from Arizona, I was there for about a year, 2008. Went to Oklahoma. Only lasted two weeks, and I got caught with a banger because the Southerners kicked it off with the cops. And then I wound up coming all the way back to California in 2011. So I spent like two years in the hole out there. What you get into it with the skinheads about? Because uh, there was a, I think it was like in Soledad or Solano. I cannot never get the part right. Some people say it was Soledad. Uh, it was a northerner who was a uh, he was white, but he wasn't labeled a northerner just yet. We all know he was a Norteño. He got placed in a cell with a white boy, and he tried to tell that me. See, the homies have a policy: you can't talk to the administration, you can't talk to cops. So he's telling the homies like, "Hey, bro, like I'll sell up with the skinny, bro. I can't sell up with them. What do you guys want me to do?" He can't tell the cops, hey, bro, I need you to move me. And the skinheads can't tell the cops that hey, you need to move him. Those are considered PC moves, cowardice acts. So whatever happened within three days, the homie winds up blasting that skinhead in the cell and almost takes his life. Some people say that dude died, but I don't. I didn't hear that part. I heard hey, when I got the, fil the filter that we locked, they were like, hey, bro, the homie engaged on a skinhead. Be ready. And usually when it's gang wars, it becomes statewide. So um, all I did was when I got to my facility, they told me, hey, we're on a half 60 with the whites. And so I didn't know where we were on a, uh, this, this be diplomatic to see how it goes. But I think the, the skinheads were already like, man, we're going to engage on the northerners. So when they were running showers, they just popped my neighbor's door and they popped my door. Like, hey, you guys want showers? And I was like, yeah, but I looked to my right. They had popped their door. So they came out in their boxes. These dudes were some big old country white dudes. And I was like, oh, shit. And I didn't have, a, I, at the time, I was still learning how to loop a banger. So I didn't give me a banger. So I had a dummy banger in my butt. So I was just like, well, I ain't going to drop that. So we stepped out. I squared out just to defend myself. And they took off. So we got, we got into a two-on-two. -two. There were some big-ass white boys. Did you win or lose? I lost. I lost. I lost. <laughs>
I tried. I tried. But every time that boy hit me, bro, I was like, damn, that shit hurts, man. And, but remember, I, I can't. I was 18. I was maybe like 5'9", five, 5'10", five, but I was still fresh off the streets smoking dope. So I gained a little bit of weight in county, but not that much. I was doing too many burpees. So when I got to prison, bro, I was skinny as hell. And these dudes were like 200 or something pounds of all muscular. Like they can just pull tractors with their muscles. I was like, man, these are big, bro. And my, they didn't even help that my celly was smaller than me. He was like 90 pounds. So yeah, we got we got demolished. We got demolished. Then you said there was a, you were in some, were you in some riots there in state prison? Yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, when I got to Susanville in 08, it kicked off with the Blacks, the, the Northern Cali Crip car. But see, we thought it was going to be an isolated incident, a couple of Northerners against the Northern California Crip car, but all the Blacks jumped. So when all the Blacks jumped, all the Northerners had to jump. And then it started kicking off in the buildings right after the fact. We went on lockdown. And then that's when they were like, look, we're going to take the Northerners and we're going to send them out of state on a legal out of state transfer and left the Blacks there. That was over some drugs. The homie was bringing in some drugs for a black dude while he was bringing in drugs to himself. The black food felt like the homie was burning them, wasn't giving them his full stash. They tried to talk it out on the yard, and the black started threatening them. Like, hey, bro, you don't give me my show, or you, you don't pay me, bro, we go, I'm going to beat your woo woo. And that's, that's considered an immediate threat. He posed a threat by threatening into the homie's life. So the homies came up with a plan of attack. He engaged. I was a part of the first wave to go engage. I was part of the wave that if any other blacks jump, jump. And they, oh my God, bro. I just, the blacks unified in one and all blacks jumped in. So it became a one big riot. In a slur. I mean, what, I mean, how long did it last? Let me ask you that. It didn't last too long, uh, maybe a couple of minutes. Because once they start firing the guns and the gas canisters come, you can't breathe. And once they throw maybe like five or 10 canisters, it just turns into a big old fog, a big old mist. So you can't see what you're doing. So everybody's just pulling back, pulling back. And everybody's just like retreating to their own station. And you had the bars over here with the blacks. The blacks wind up laying, laying down by the Muslim section because they were having Muslim services when the dude came out. He was Muslim. And that's when the homies walked up to him by the table next to him, which are neutral area tables. You'll never see a North Daniel there. So to see three North Daniels right there at these neutral tables was a, was a red flag. And they just rushed him and started slicing him in his face with razor blades. The blacks rushed. The blacks seen it rushed that way. And the homies rushed that way. So they laid down by the Muslim station. We wound up uh, laying down by. So you said these dudes, they were laying in one section by the Muslims. Where are you guys laid down at? We're by, we're by our pull-up bars. And uh, like, you know that game, the horseshoe game? Where you throw the horseshoes on a little stick? We're, lay, we're laying down over there towards the track. So we're on the opposite side, like I said. The ride happens like this, but when the bombs go off, we split apart. They go back to the Muslim station, and we lay in our neutral area, our area where we shared with the blacks. That's where we all laid down. And that's pretty much how it happened. Everybody gets handcuffs. The only the three homies that did the slice went to the hall. Everybody else got put back in their buildings. We went on lockdown. And then they uh they started doing institutional searches. Once the searches were done, then we got the what we had a, every one North Daniel out of every building had to come out, and one black out of every building had to come out. And they put us in these cages where the boxing bag used to be at. So we were split from a to a, from a fence. And that's when we started talking about, you know, diplomatic stuff. But it was hard because some people were getting antsy. So while we're trying to be diplomatic and squash the issue and, and, and figure out why it grew up the way it grew up, Northerners were still getting off on blacks and blacks were still coming out and knocking out Northerners. And it was just becoming like we were trying to stop everything from happening, but they weren't giving us no movement. So it was making it hard for us to communicate with the other buildings. So that's why they started picking one individual out of each, ways change and happen, so that we can go back to our building, ride our kites amongst our building, can't tell everybody, hey, we'll ceasefire for now. It was supposed to be small, but we didn't realize that even though we were going at it with the Northern Cali Crip Corps, all the blacks are gonna jump because it's a black issue. We thought, hey bro, the rest of these blacks from LA are gonna jump for these blacks from up north, but at the end of the day, they united and jumped all together. We That's the misrepresentation that we had. That's why I threw up so big. I mean, who came out the winners? I want to say the, the homies that did the slicing came out the winners. I seen a lot more homies get dropped that day. I got punched pretty hard in the ear. That shit hurt, too. That's my ears ringing for like two minutes. But I'm going to say a lot of homies got hurt, but just by what hands. A couple of us had bangers, but the bangers we were using weren't effective. Let's see it. They get hit once or twice, and they run. So it's like I was poking people like through jackets. Because remember, like I said, it was kind of snowing. So everybody was out there in sweaters and jackets. 
they were not effective. So it's like all of us that had weapons, we weren't doing that much damage other than the homie doing the spicing. So I'm going to give more to the blacks. A lot of northerners did handle their business, but I seen a lot of homies get dropped in the process because remember, it's snowy, it's slippery, and we're talking about the size differences. A lot of my homies were small. I maybe had like maybe 10 big homies that were like, you know, cool, like 6'1", six, 6'2", six, with muscles. The rest of us, man, we're like 5'9", five, 5'8". Five, so yeah, I don't, I, I wouldn't give it to us other than the homies that did their thing and really like kick it off. You guys got a, you guys got like a, a all weapon policy though? I thought that's what it was in the fit. No, I'm not in, in, on the level threes of active northerners, it works like this. You're going to have a hitter and two bomber. So the hitter will come hit you a few times and then walk off. And the people that, that are bombing on you have no weapon. No weapon makes it a more lenient case. But now, now that the big homies are on the yard, everything is a hit policy, 17 hit policy. You're going to, they're trying to take your win now. But, but on the level fours, 180, it's always being, bro, no, there ain't no fist fights, bro. It's all weapons. Everybody has to carry a weapon. So, I mean, you know, you switch back and forth. I mean, you're riding with one group, you ride with another group. But eventually you end up, do you leave the gang life or no? I, uh, when I got, I got removed twice off the main line for dirty politics. And I was being a scatless individual with leadership positions. So when I went in SLY, yeah, I did join a gang. I, uh, we, my politics rose up all the way to uh, like six months. So I went home, oh, catching fights, fights, batteries after batteries, jumping people, knocking people out. I came home. And I wasn't trying to push it. I was just like, ah, whatever, I'm home. But it came to me. A lot of Northerners on the streets came to me, started finding out about me because I was dating a lot of different women. I was dating women that were dating Northerners. So once I got jumped the first time, I was like, well, forget this. I ain't going to be out here just you know, hiding out. There's no reason to hide. They already know who I am. So I started going at it with the Northerners. I started getting into a lot of street fights. I got jumped at the Marriott Hotel. I got jumped at the, at the recording studio that I was doing music at. And then a bowling alley, and I was like, then I started doing one on ones. I was like, dude, like I started getting fed up. So we, I started beefing with Northerners a lot. And then uh, I got politics against my own. The riders at the time, Snoop, which is the president, which is the, the leader now, but he wasn't the leader back when I was pushing it. He politicked against me all over YouTube. And that's how I really got my YouTube channel started. People started asking, like, who I was. Because I went at him. I targeted him. I started airing out his dirty laundry. Me and him had like, personal. It was like an egotistical thing. He seen that I, I became influential with the group. He doesn't like that. He wants to spot I to always be on him. So when we started beefing all over YouTube and I'm making videos about him, he's making videos about me, people were like, hey, bro, we want to hear your story. I didn't think much of it. I started telling my story. And the more and more I started telling my story, the more I started seeing that my, my channel was becoming successful. I just woke up one day and I was like, bro, I don't want to be here. I'll be just to be a gang member on YouTube. But I'm going to try to do something different. I want to be positive for what's in my life. And I did, and then some things transpired on the streets between the riders and me and Snoop, where I was like, you know what? They're doing me dirty anyways. I said, you know what? I'll cool off this gang banging shit. And then my son, my girl came, she was like, I'm pregnant. And then I just sat out through that whole nine months of uh, her being pregnant. I was like, bro, I don't, I don't want to bring my son into this world where it's just full of drama, bro. Like, I had so much drama. They shot my mom's house up. They shot my car up. I was shooting back at people when I wasn't supposed to. And I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to bring my first kid into this world at the age of 36. And he has to deal with this drama. So I had to make it a point. Like, bro, I, I got to stop what I'm doing now. And then it was the, the day he was born. I was like, bro, there's nothing I'm going to do to get this kid caught up in this. And I said, if I don't change now, bro, I'm never going to change. So I made that change. I don't care how embarrassing it is. A lot of people would make fun of me. I hear a dropout, whatever, dropout, or a dropout. I, I could be that because it just works. I go, at the end of the day, when I see my success and I see that I was making a difference, I seen how mothers were coming up to me like, yeah, I show my kids your guys your videos every day to teach them how to be part of the gang. I was like, dude, I finally became what I needed to become, finally, bro. It took it took me going through hell. It took me getting backstabbed multiple times to realize, like, bro, the gang life ain't shit. I want to be a father now. So every day I look at my son, I was like, bro, there's no way in hell I ever want to see this food pick up a wear red or pick up a gun or pick up a flag or, or go to juvie or get into a fight. I want the best for my son. So I say, you know what? I don't want to be associated with nothing. Talk about this, right? Because you put in some work. Did you ever have any status anywhere? Yeah, I was, uh, I got status on the streets, right? But it didn't mean nothing to me. There was a lot of NF members out there running the streets, politicking. They had, a, they had this thing called the Scorpion program where they could fool me without two Nathaniels sponsoring me. That's how you really get pulled as a Nathaniel. 
So when I had, when I was on the main line, I was in Orfanio all the way up until 2011 with status. But I just started holding high ranking positions until I got out of state. And then when I came back from out of state, my training was, you know, just the head of security, block channel, tier security. When I got to Susanville, I was a squad leader. Then I was, I, I ran the squad department. Then I became the, the maestro, which is more Daniel teacher. I was given the lower level COC positions because I needed to be trained. I was never trained on COC training. Then when I got out of state, one of my sellers was like, hey, bro, you, you've never ran a prison before. And I was like, nah. He goes, well, you're going to start today. And he gave me the prison and I fucked everything up. I, I made bad decision after bad decision after bad decision thinking I was making right decisions because they're your decisions to make. So nobody can tell you right or wrong. These are your decisions to make. And I was making them on righteous reasons, but then I was making some on non-righteous reasons because I was being taught a certain way, but being told to do it a different way because, hey, bro, we're not in California. California rules will apply. These are Arizona rules. We can make our own rules up. And I was like, you're right. Okay, I agree with that. Not knowing that I was against the rules anyways. So I came back to Cali with a, making a bunch of terrible mistakes. Let me ask you this, right? The Nortenials that I've been around, I've been out in some Nortenial yards like USP Lee and I've been some places around some dudes. But it seemed like you guys were always kind of like militant and, you know, I've seen them dudes writing them little ass letters they had to write with a little ass, you know, I, I, I can't imagine doing that. Um, you know, some of the homies that were over there, you know, you guys had to work out. They, he wouldn't let them wear no tennis shoes. They, they had to work out in their boots. Matt rolled up first thing in the morning. Really militant, right? But at the same time, probably doing some backwards stuff too, though, like you just said, man. You know, that's like I talk about Stevie Burke sometimes out of Boston. He was the shot caller for our car. And I was like, wow, this dude, like, he's eating healthy. He's doing yoga. And then he's shooting dope at night. It's like an oxymoron, right? Yeah, it is oxymoron. Uh, see, the, so there, there, you're always going to run into leadership positions where individuals uphold the law to the fullest. But then you're going to get individuals like myself who let the power get to them because I didn't know how to use it right. I didn't know how to use it properly. I was just being told, like, hey, bro, you could do what you want. You could do what you want. You could do this. You don't have to answer to nobody else because this is your prison where it gets to your head. Power always corrupts the mind. So you'll run into good leadership dudes where they'll hesitate to make a decision because they're afraid to make the wrong move. And they'll uphold the laws. Then you're going to run into a half of individuals like myself that are like, bro, I'm going to run it the way I run it. This is my government. This is my establishment. The big homies are just going to get my 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 yearly reports about what took place, who I removed. It is an oxymoron because you're supposed to be doing it for a righteous reason. But when you look at it from a different angle, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. People do it just to gain. They want those high-level positions because they're the ones that get to touch the dope. They want them high level positions because they get to touch the, the household bank and, the, and their bank. So they get access to the money. Them high level positions get access to the phones. The low level positions don't. So some people thrive and rise to the ranks only to gain and reap the benefits that are available only for high rank members. Let me ask you this. I'm not going to say where you live or anything, but I don't, I don't know if you've said that. Are you afraid, man? You ever worried about some retaliation? And I mean, you got a family now. You got a wife and you got two stepkids and. You got your own son. Are you worried? I've always been worried, but I was worried before my son was born. But the thing is, I didn't have no responsibilities and I was just a kid. I was single. I was thugging it. I wanted to be on the street sleeping with every girl possible because every girl seen me as like, I'm fresh out. I was damn near a virgin. So I was, I, I let I let the power of the feed get the best of me. And then when I started beeping with everybody, I told myself, bro, they go on me. There's nobody in my family that they can target. But when I got into a relationship and I have my stepkids now and then I have my son, I was like, damn, bro, like now it's going to start eating other people. Because now that I've been doing YouTube and doing a lot more article, articles, I've been seeing other innocent people get targeted even more now, especially with the ghost massacre. They, they killed a six-month-old baby. And I was like, damn, bro, like what is a six-month-old baby? So now I started really thinking like, bro, I don't want them ever to gun my son down. And sometimes I'd walk outside with my son, holding my son in my arms, and it would cross my mind. The car I passed by, I'm like, damn, bro, if he dumped at me because it's me and my son's in my arms, bro, like, he don't deserve this. He don't deserve this. So, yeah, I'm worried every day. But I think my message is powerful enough. Like, I'm still making a change. I'm still making a difference. But that's why I relocated. I found a new area. You know, my family's safe. I'm safe. And I found myself in a position now, like, why don't I, I got a peace of mind now where I don't have to worry about that. Well, you know what? I hope you stay safe. I hope you continue to be a good father. I hope you continue to, you know, do the things that you're doing because you are doing some positive stuff now. You turn your life around, right? 
not always easy when you come from that lifestyle and you've been living that life for so long. So before we get ready to go, we'll talk a little bit about your YouTube channel. Tell people where they can find you at, bro. Uh, Renegade Media on YouTube. My Instagram's uh, at 59 underscore J-A-Y-Y. J, my Renegade Media channel, bro, I'm, I'm starting to turn it over to TikTok. And since I've been using clips from my TikTok, on, I mean, from my YouTube to my TikTok, my TikTok's blowing up like crazy, and I'm getting a lot of positive support. All I'm trying to do now is like, look, I came from both sides of the world. I was active for a long time, got done dirty. When SNY joined the gang on, 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 on resentment, hate, and passion, got done dirty. So I realized, like, bro, gangs are just going to do you dirty in the process. Everybody's going to get done dirty. So now that I have a son into this world, which, to be honest with you, being fatherhood is harder than being a gang member, bro. Like, I it's I still don't know how to change the diaper. It's six months later. I have a problem with that. I, have a, I don't know how to put my son to sleep, and I panic. I'm afraid for him. When he cries and I don't know what he's crying for, that scares me. That scares me more than catching a straight bullet. So I'm like, bro, I need to focus on fatherhood and my YouTube channel because my YouTube channel has become successful enough so I can give my son anything he wants, anything he needs. I can provide for my family more than these nine to fives that I've ever done. And I still work the nine to fives. I still do the YouTube channel. I'm just trying to give my son the best life possible, move him out of the area where we're at, where it was dangerous. That's what my YouTube consists of. And every day I get a message on Instagram, hey man, my son's he's changing his ways. Hey, my 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 my, I, my one of my brothers is senior video. He's he's cleaning his act up. He's recovering from addiction. I'm a, I'm a, I might not be correcting the whole world, but I'm doing something of a difference. And some people are changing, and I take credit for that and I respect that. That's what's up, man. I appreciate you, man. Anything you want to say before we go? Hey, like I always say, man, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this. Try to get it done. Peace. Well, listen, man, I definitely appreciate you. I'm going to tell people, man, if you like what we're doing, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Go check this brother out. His links are in the uh, description. I think he's got a hell of a message and he's interesting. And he tells some good ass stories. And I think that you should check him out, man. I'll uh, definitely appreciate you coming on, bro. Again, with respect, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out. <laughs>